So what if I told you back in 1963, a small Swiss watchmaker made a mechanical chronograph designed as a sports watch, but also for pilots, divers, motor racing, athletes, and just about any situation. Well, this super do-it-all chronograph is back. Today, we are reviewing the legendary Chronomaster. Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. As you guys know, every month I like to include either a new watch or brand not previously covered, basically to keep things fresh and also to expand horizons, not just for you guys, but also for myself, even if it is detrimental to my wallet. So today is one of those days with a brand that I've had my eye on for a while. Now, before we get into this, to support the channel and to see more completely free, unsponsored, truly independent reviews, don't forget to click like on this video. So this devilishly attractive uh, piece here we have today is the Nevada Gretchen uh, Chronomaster. Uh, but don't let its uh, elegant vintage charms fool you. This is a serious, serious piece and far from your typical chronograph. I'll do a quick wristwatch check. Talking vintage inspired. Oh my God, look at that. That's the Safari there. And it is of course on the Melange strap from Wrist Candy Watch Club. Nevada Gretchen, as the latter name suggests, was founded in Gretchen, Switzerland in 1879 as a small family business of watchmakers assembling timepieces for other brands, then becoming a watchmaker in their own right in 1926, adding the family name of Nevada to the brand name. You may already be familiar with Gretchen as it happens to be where ETA and Fortis have their factories. This close proximity to these brands helped Nevada in being a very early producer of some of the world's first automatic watches during the 1920s. The company then grew, especially after World War II during the 1950s and 60s, with the launch of many of its main collections of watches that continue to this day. First and most notably was the Antarctic in 1950. This automatic waterproof watch was worn by members of the American Navy's Deep Freeze One task force during their expeditions in the South Pole from 1955 to 1956. This watch immediately gained recognition for its ability to be reliable and robust enough to perform in the most extreme of conditions. This success enabled the brand to concentrate on developing further specialist tool watches during the end of the 1950s and the start of the 60s, especially as demand was rapidly growing. What followed was the Depthomatic, the first ever skin diver with a depth gauge indicator complication. The Depth Master, a dive watch that could withstand an impressive pressure of 100 atmos or 1000 meters water resistance, soon followed. Then in 1963 came the debut of the brand's most iconic and revolutionary watch, the legendary Chronomaster. The goal of this watch was simple, a tough, diving capable chronograph that could be used on land, sea or air, in any environment or any situation. A multi-purpose, multi-genre watch with as many complications packed in as possible while still remaining classically styled. After succumbing to the woes of the quartz crisis, along with the passing away of the original family and its heirs, in 2018, a group of watch industry veterans bought this brand and brought this cult icon back with what we are looking at today. So unlike the uh, 1960s originals, we have a modern materials here, like the uh, double domed sapphire glass with AR coating. I'm pretty sure it's just on the inside. We have contrasting uh, brushed finish there, very wide, generous beveling that tapers down, uh, and of course, brushed on the sides and in the indentations of that cog wheel style uh, grip 
there to the bezel. This particular manual wind version comes on a rubber strap. This is a vulcanized rubber strap, really, really nicely done. Good, sturdy quality at the same time nice fluidity to it and of course perforated and i love the uh, i'm not sure if you guys can see that but i love that retro style the way they've written it so cool bolt action spring bar there so very very quick and easy obviously this affects the price for a little bit more you can get the what they call the oyster style and i think there's a beaded bracelet as well and if i'm not mistaken leather but i went for rubber i just i, I, I there's something about it actually you know what We'll discuss why I went for rubber later on. I just love that uh, Tropic kind of retro look. I, I think it really complements it. In terms of dimensions, with the bezel, it protrudes to 39, but the case is a little bit um, underneath there, obviously for, for enhanced grip there, but uh, it's a 38 in diameter. Lug to lug, 46.5. We got quite a tall height there of 13.8 uh, millimeters, 20 millimeter lug width there, just an absolutely outstanding size perfect for my six and a half inch wrist the water resistance is very impressive at 100 meters despite not having uh, a screw down crown or screw down pushes um, quite rare in uh, chronographs standard uh, piston head style design a really generous size they've kept the proportions very faithful to the originals the bezel is not ratcheted uh, it's bi-directional because we have 60 minute dive style scale there on the periphery and of course the smaller 12 hour scale on the inside uh, very nifty indeed um, so obviously if you're changing time zones for pilots that's the reason for it actually i have to say the resistance is perfectly fine it's almost a bit like my um, tudor submariner that's also bi-directional the Superluminova markers are also kept to the scale of the originals. And while they are rather diminutive, they do a great job. The broad arrow hand is absolutely fantastic. Easily to distinguish the hours from minutes, hence that's, that's its purpose. That's why it's so different. You can get versions with different hands. Uh, I, I would have loved to see the lollipop on this particular version. So that would have had loom on the second hand of the chronograph, but not a big deal. And you can even choose to have a faux patinaed one. So we got greater orientation because of course we have the Speedmaster style, the flanking dots there, the 12 o'clock. So you always know where 12 o'clock is. This is a, a nod to its racing slash uh, pilot watch uh, inspirations, which we'll talk about in just a moment. There's a lot of detail on this dial, but yeah, it's kept quite clean uh, thanks to that uni compacts layout the outer seconds track there is a one fifth of the second so good precise reading and i've got to say the ergonomics on this thing is fantastic uh, especially the bezel just like the first chrono masters we have an outsourced movement in this case the 27 joule Solita SW510MBHB which is the cam operated manual wind version. You can choose to have the automatic if you wish. Back in the day it was of course ETA, Landeron, Venus and even culminating in some really cool column wheel movements with the Valjoux Caliber 23 and 92. While not exactly reinventing the wheel here, these calibers have a well proven reliability easy and economical to service, giving you a 30 minute counter at the three o'clock, running seconds at nine, all operating at a pleasingly smooth 28,800 vibrations an hour and boasting 48 hours of power reserve. This no fuss utilitarian Swiss made movement is a perfect match and keeps the watch in a relatively affordable price point as a whole, considering the competition out there of course. Accuracy wise, it does not state the amount of regulation carried out at the factory before shipping, unless I missed it of course, but here I'm getting a near chronometer level of performance, so I can't really complain. At a quick glance, naturally comparisons will inevitably be made to the Amiga Speedmaster and maybe some of the later Hoyer chronographs. It's almost impossible to review a 60s style chronograph and have that not happen. However, this feels very different in person and if you really study the intricacies of its design, you will see how elegantly it blends elements of diver, pilot and racing watch into one cohesive, handsome design. Which, let's not forget, at the beginning of the 1960s was still new and cutting edge tech for the time. 
I adore the wide brushed surfaces of the angular lugs that taper down confidently, perfectly proportioned. This is echoed in the matching beveling of the equally attractive buckle of the strap. There's no messy date window on the dial to interrupt the equidistantly placed subdials that, in this panda configuration, are jet black for extra legibility. The only pop of colour here is the candy red at the three o'clock for yachtsmen for timing five minute warning signals. Did I not mention earlier that this was designed for any situation? The subdials feature a lance style handset. These varied greatly, just as much as the endless combinations of dial and hands that are excellently and extensively documented in the amazing Chronomaster only book. The fact that this book was published is a testament to the cult following of this watch. At the six o'clock position is the perfectly printed words Aviator and Sea Diver. Normally very contradictory on the watch, but here it serves as a reminder of this watch's pioneering do-it-all ambitions. The main difference between this and its vintage inspiration is the dial has been made ever so slightly larger in relation to the bezel being a smidgen smaller. This is not a noticeable trade, but I think a wise move to increase general readability. The way the bezel insert gently slopes upwards towards the glass frames and adds a charming sense of flow. Lastly, and perhaps the most subtle added feature, is all the sharply printed dial text is on a raised embossed surface, adding a functional but nice bit of refinement to the dial. So in terms of negatives, it is a little bit tubby, not uh, this brand's fault. It is, of course, a famous trait of the 7750, which this Solita is based on. The pronounced dome does kind of make it not as cuff friendly as it sh uh, as I would like it to be. For me, really the biggest downfall was the 100 meters water resistance. Like I said, yeah, it's still very impressive for a chronograph, which, you know, many points of entry like the pushers, etc. I would like to sit 200 meters like the originals are because I think that's what made them so unique and kind of really head and shoulders above the rest. Although 100 meters is absolutely fine. Speaking of the movement, uh, while I have got rid of the ghost uh, date, we still have the ghost position as you can see there on the crown. In terms of the construction and quality, it's outstanding. There were some inconsistencies on the dial printing. Very, very minor. You can't see it with the naked eye, but of course with the unforgiving macro lens, especially on that red section. Again, not the end of the world. I'm really nitpicking here, as you can see. Next, well, it's got to be said, this more petite scale will alienate the larger wrists. Uh, those who um, just prefer larger watches, you know. On my six and a half inch wrist, it's absolutely perfect scale. You know, so, so comfortable. I really enjoyed this. Next thing is the tachymeter at the very edge of the dial is difficult to read. If you look at it head on, you almost don't see it. You have to kind of tilt it at an angle due to this domed crystal. I mean, this is the complication you're least likely to use. Pretty much there for aesthetics, unlike back in the day where these were serious, serious, depended on tools. In the early 1960s, the Swiss chronograph market was booming. So how do you stand out from the competition? You innovate. Nevada Gretchen's solution is just as compelling now as it was then. It's a true do-it-all watch. One of the hardest things to pull off when it comes to watch design. It seems so logical today, but let's not forget this was a pre-digital world. This is the first time I've experienced a mechanical chronograph I would feel completely comfortable wearing out on a jog, covered in sweat, or in a pool, or during a proper Hogarthian gin-soaked knees up, and not to have to worry about it at all. Try doing that with a Speedy. To me, a vintage-styled mechanical chrono you can actually use as a beater, but still wear all suited, booted and dapper just really appeals to me. Of course, I would prefer and be willing to pay for a thinner, more refined column wheel actuated movement, like they did with the restored Vauju 23 movements in their Paul Newman Chronomaster re-editions. That would have elevated this watch to a whole new level, but sadly twice the price too, I suspect. But a few minor gripes aside, this watch just oozes 
just as much class as the Speedy, but for a third of the price, and maybe even more capable. Tasteful in aesthetics, unpretentious in execution, this is a fun, stylish watch that is as invigorating as it is a welcome change from the predictable choices on the market today. As the glorious book about this watch can attest to, this is a remarkably rewarding rabbit hole to get lost in. I notice now that I tend to get this kind of warm, fuzzy feeling when I encounter certain watches that really do it for me, like a vintage Samariner, Navi Timers, Bond Seamasters, or the Squale 1521 are just a few examples. Well, I get the same feeling here. And just as I was thinking that the vintage inspired watch market is oversaturated, and I really did not expect it when I opened the stylishly decorated box it came in. The main strength of this watch is exactly what it was supposed to be designed for, ultimate versatility. And being mainly in monochrome, it lends itself to another urban gentry trademark phrase since 2016. Yes, you guessed it, it's a strap monster. I mean, it even has spring bar holes. The watch elitists and snobs of the past called it the poor man's Hoya. Well, that is the thinking of a poor mind. This is a watch for those that appreciate something a little off the beaten, cliched path. Ragazzi, this is a capolavoro. It's kind of like a, a watch enthusiast's icon. It's not a mainstream icon like the Speedy or the Subby, but I think that really means something. Lastly, before we go, I've got to say a massive thank you to Nevada Gretchen for lending this in and that beautiful book, which I'm a little bit sad I have to <laughs> have to return. I might actually buy the book and add it to my own collection. So yeah, a massive respect to them. Every time a brand actually goes out of their way and, and lend stuff in because you'd be surprised how many still refuse because obviously the negative section but I mean what's the point of a review if you're if you're not critical right uh, I mean respectfully critical of course but anyway I'm not here to talk about the the um, ethics of watch reviews uh, let me know your thoughts queries comments opinions all the rest of it down below what can I say absolute pure class uh, don't forget to like this video very important indeed if you want to see more free content like this thank you for watching and I will catch you in the next one Okay, ciao.